I think progressivism fundamentally is about freedom and it's about non-essentialism. I think that at its root, progressivism is about understanding that fundamentally we're, we're all basically the same. There are some differences between us, but for the most part, um, we want to live our lives with the, the, the right to you know, handle ourselves however we like, as long as we're not hurting other people. And in order to do that, you know, you need to prioritize freedom. You need to prioritize the ability to see past people's surface values and not make um, intuitive ascriptions to their character based on what you see. And this is why, you know, I, I don't like the political chart, the, the compass, right? With the auth left, auth right, mm. um, lib left, live right. It's because I don't really think auth left is a thing. And I think that historically, that has been the case. Countries or societies which are highly authoritarian are overwhelmingly highly reactionary as well. I don't know how you could ideologically parse an obsession with state control or with um, an adherence to social norms and tradition while also allowing for a free range of personal expression when it comes to gender identity or whatever else. What's the best way you can make sure that people with a lot of money don't have outsized influence on politics or like what's the best way to keep money out of politics oh that's a tough one well i mean the like the long-term goal would be you know total decommodification or worker cooperative based society but uh, that's obviously kind of like answering the question with you know well what if we just fixed everything i think um th there are a couple of like obvious things we could do right off the bat like citizens united stuff we need total transparency when it comes to um where money is being found in politics and also limits to it. You know, the more we put a stranglehold on where money is allowed to come from in many of these political races, I think the better and healthier our democracy will be. The point of a democracy, after all, is that especially when it comes to voting in a candidate, you know, everyone gets an equal say. If you have um, a system where a very small group of people have an enormously disproportionate effect, it's kind of difficult to call that a democracy. At the very least, it's, it's closer to an oligarchy. And right now, it is, of course, the, the capitalists, the people with the money who have a ridiculous amount of influence because their money sustains these political parties, and that means the political parties have to cater to them. Transparency is step one. Limitations on what can be donated is step two. I also think that better funding the IRS and other agencies that sort of regulate and manage the flow of money would be pretty good because a lot of crimes are being committed right now. Our agencies either just don't have the money, the manpower, or the, let's say, initiative to go after the people that are, are committing these crimes. So uh, at, at the moment, unfortunately, a lot of it is like constitutional regulatory stuff. But the further along we go, I think the more amenable people will be to systemic solutions to these issues. We're all here in Progressive Victory, and a big mission that we've talked about is moving officials to the left, even if they're not ones that we directly elected. So we didn't have a hand in it, but we're, we're trying to lobby them, we're trying to move them on stuff. I guess I wanted to ask from a left-wing point of view, because liberals and conservatives have models and more money than we could dream of to do this already, mm -hmm. what does that look like for us? It really depends on how sincere the politician is, I think. Some politicians are, maybe not many at the federal level especially, but some politicians are motivated sincerely by values that they hold. You know, they will take unpopular positions if they think they're morally right. They will try to get what they think is right done. Um, sometimes they'll make sacrifices, but for the most part, they, they care about what they believe in. And some people are purely like, just get me reelected, you know, party hacks, partisan hacks. And, you know, I, I can't make a guess as to how much of, of either or one specific person is. But I think when you're talking to them, you're not going to move the latter group, the, the hack, with anything other than like, polling data and a structured argument on the popularity of some subjects. And that's, you know, I mean, that's math to them, right? When it comes to the value stuff, though, I think the main thing that Democrats especially need to get on board with is the fact that when it comes to politics, you know, you only get a tiny fraction of what you want to do done, especially at the state level. And as long as that's the case, you need to direct your energy and attention towards the subjects of greatest import, the subjects of greatest focus. And the Republicans, as unethical and maybe ill-advised as their hyperfixation on trans people is, it is a fixation. It is a national strategy, isn't it? It represents coordination across all levels of the Republican constituency, you know, from, from the federal level all the way down to the voters, an alignment on a subject. And I think selling Democrat politicians on that would be a good idea, not on the Republican side of the issue, but on the idea of directing 
their attention towards the, 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 front, the front of the issue, you know? You can't just ignore this trans stuff because this trans stuff isn't just an esoteric, sidelined, minor social issue. It might have been 20 years ago, I'll admit. The subject at that time might have been like a kind of, you know, like niche, marginal one. But right now it's the forefront of a massive political push. And if you want to be relevant and if you want to get stuff done, you have to focus on those axes, where you can get people's attention. And I hope, I, I, I think a lot of people, especially the, the Democrats, they're not malicious. They're just kind of out of touch. A lot of them are just sort of old and they remember Bill Clinton and they remember, you know, they've been in power for a while, many of them. And, and, and you know, they hear about all this trans stuff. And to them, it just comes across as a hysterical fad Republicans are pushing. But it's not. It's meaningful and it needs to be responded to in kind. So on that note, actually, we have a question from Jacob, uh, who asks, how do I advocate for radical progressive action in my family slash community of liberals? How can we most effectively convince liberals to take the fascist threat seriously? Well, I would say we have to look to historical parallels, but like Ron DeSantis right now is, is threatening to arrest teachers for not adhering to a white list of accepted content in schools, which cannot include any mention of, of queer people. So I, so I feel like it's not even a matter of looking at history. You can just point at that. But it's about how you sell it, too. There are so many signs that what is going on is, is distinct, is special. It's not, it's not the way things used to be. I think drawing a historical parallel can still be valuable if you can, if you can try to build a case that there is this long-standing resentment on the part of the Republicans about the social battles they lost like 60 70 years ago the civil rights act you know like all those conservatives back then like mlk died an unpopular man all those conservatives back then you know all those southerners they voted in democrats at the time many of them but if you take a look at these constituencies where they are what they supported how did the individual politicians move man that didn't go away overnight you know, and there's been this building resentment, I think, that's been that's been coded and underlaid. You know, you can talk about the Southern strategy with Nixon, but it has remained. And right now we're seeing all of this rise to the top. Go to Twitter right now. Just browse the For You page, which has been trashed by Elon's algorithm. What are you going to see? Well, leaving aside all the attacks on trans people, there are a lot of white nationalists on there. And they're not getting small numbers in their retweets and likes either. There are a lot of people just flat out, like, just posting videos of black people getting into fights, you know, as though I didn't grow up seeing a million videos of white Southerners getting into fights, you know, hicks or hillbillies or whatever. But no, it's always black people. And they're saying, these people are animals. We need to build a nation without them, da 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 But that ain't nothing. There are Republicans in the Senate and the House right now who have expressed pretty overtly white nationalist sentiments. If you get them on this narrative, I think they can understand... Republicans, not after January 6th, man, Republicans aren't vying for like a, you know, a, an argument over which direction to take the country in. They don't want an argument. They just want to take the country in a direction. They'll do it by force if they need to. And the direction they want to take it is it's pretty, pretty, as much of an objectively bad direction as you can get from a moral anti-realist, you know, we're, we're talking bad stuff, but you don't want to come across hysterical. Be matter of fact about it. Be conscious of what they consider to be a big problem, even if you think their priorities are out of order. And over time, I think you can make this case fairly to a lot of liberals.